Today's weekend wing shop is quite a doozy. It features some cross picking, some arpeggio shapes moving all over the place, and hopefully at the end of the day it's going to learn you a thing or two about the way that your neck is arranged. Check it out. Greetings and welcome to this week's installment of Weekend Wing Shop. Here's your best buddy, Uncle Ben. Now look here kids, my goal by the end of this video is to give you guys some great stuff to work on your cross picking chops because as we know, the man who controls his alternate picking controls his own fate and destiny. And also learn you guys a thing or two about the way the fretboard is arranged because if you start thinking about notes and shapes as being relative to one another, then you can really make sense of this thing really fast. So hopefully this is going to get you guys some pretty good stuff in them old noggins of yours. But before we get into it, let's hear it again and step that speed. And as always, for a full time, you can visit my Instagram page over at Ben Eller Guitars. Give me a follow while you're over there. Find the tab for this week's lesson, learn how to play it, then upload a video of yourself shredding through it, along with the hashtag Weekend Wank Shop. Okay, so first things first, this week's lick is two different arpeggios repeating in various shapes across the neck. It's an F major arpeggio and a G major arpeggio. You could kind of think of these as being relative to the key of C. That'd be the four chord and the five chord in the key of C. But the cool thing about this is, is you can also play this entire lick and all these different arpeggios over a static F chord. It'll give you a really cool kind of F Lydian sound, which sounds pretty dang expensive. Now, before we start getting into the lick, let me break down a really simple fact for you that I want you to absorb into your weekend wanker heads as good as you can. For every F, and I'm talking about for every F note, for every F power chord, for every F chord, for every F arpeggio, whatever. For every F, there is a G one step ahead of it. That's two frets ahead of it. I don't want you to be thinking about what string you're on, what fret number you're on, or anything like that. I just really want you guys to absorb it that if you are on an F of any kind, even some kind of funky, not often used F shape, you can dang well bet that if you move up two frets, there will be a G shape. F to G. F to G, F to G, all over the place. The notes and their arrangement to each other is static. It never changes. And I think a lot of times guitar players get overly confused with this stuff because they're thinking, well, on this string it's one and three, and on this string it's six and eight or whatever. But the fact is, is that if there's an F, two frets above it, there is a G. That's a fact jack. This week's lick takes advantage of that fact by taking just a couple of common four string arpeggio shapes and moving them up in steps to show you over and over again that fact. That again, for every F, there's a G a step above it. Now you can really master the board fast if you start thinking about all the other notes that way too. You know, for every A, there's a B this far away. For every B, there's a C this far away and stuff like that. That's one of the true secrets of mastering the fretboard across the guitar, but that's a lesson for another day. Now, check this out. We'll talk about the picking last. I just want to show you guys the shapes first and then talk about the different ways that you can approach this with the picking hand. So the first arpeggio shape we're going to play here is an F major arpeggio. And what I'm doing here is I'm starting off on the first fret high E. There's our root note F. Then I'm going to play the first fret B string. That's a C note. Notice that that is one finger playing two different notes and I'm not just simply barring across them and letting them ring out together. I'm going from, you know, I kind of think of it as playing on my fingerprint to playing on my fingertip to make that happen. I'm not holding both down. Anyway, first E, first B. Then I'm gonna play the two on the G string, to A note, our third. And then the three on the D string. That's our root note again. Now you might be able to recognize that as part of a common F bar chord kind of shape, right? If you took that chord shape that we all know and kind of decapitate it, you know, cut the power chord off of it, then you'd be left with a shape that looks like what we're using in this arpeggio. So again, that's an F chord. So you know what happens a step above it? A dang G chord, which is exactly what we're gonna do here. So after you play down the F arpeggio, 
Mm. What I want you to do is have faith in this shape and have faith in the fact that for every F, there's a G a step above it. And just slide everything up two frets. I'm not literally sliding like, like that or anything. I'm making a quick position shift. And I'm going to play the five this time on the D. That's our root note G for our G major arpeggio. Four on the G string. That's our B note. Three on the B. And then three on the high E string. That's our root note G again. So, so far we played F. Up a step to G. Next, we're going to move up to the next inversion of an F shape. Now, when I say inversion, I just mean the same set of notes, just in a different order. That's all there is to it. It's going to go like this. Now, what I'm doing here to play this F arpeggio is I'm going to play the 5 on the high E string, the 6 on the B. There's our root note, F, right there. I'm going to play the 5 on the G string, and I'm going to play the 7 on the D. So that was 5, 6, 5, 7. Um, maybe if you guys are familiar with like the caged system of how chord shapes link together, you might recognize that as a what we call a C-shaped F chord. Eight, seven, five, six, five. C-shaped F chord. Maybe you recognize that. So anyway, then guess what happens? Go up two frets, and you'll find yourself a G arpeggio with the exact same shape. So we're gonna play nine on the D, seven on the G, eight on the B, seven on the high E. So now you have two different sets of F's and G's. Now the next one's tricky, and I'll show you a couple different ways to do it. This arpeggio for F is going to go 8th fret, high E, and then you're going to have the B, G, and D strings all on fret 10. So 10th B, 10th G, 10th D. Now, because those are all on the same fret, you could approach those with a rolling one finger bar. Like that. In that case, you really have to go from having kind of the, the knuckle bone, you know, that middle knuckle bone of your ring finger on the B string, play your fingerprint on the G, and then play your fingertip on the D. It's really hard to keep those from ringing out together and becoming note salad like that. So if you're approaching with a one finger roll, be really careful to, again, roll. Uh, those of you guys who watched closely in the intro might have noticed that I played it like this. Now what I did there is I played the 8 on the high E with my first finger. I played the 10th B with my third finger. I played the 10th G with my middle finger. And I played the 10th D with my first finger. So I ended up kind of creeping those fingers on top of each other. That's just something I've been kind of practicing on doing lately. Just kind of getting fingers to stack on top of each other in really weird ways. I also find too that by using different fingers, my articulation of the rhythm is kind of better than making one finger just kind of roll up and down. It's kind of that sweet picking versus a, you know alternate picking kind of thing where it's like, if I'm constantly in motion, my time is better than when I'm static. You know what I mean? You can do it either way though. So whatever works for you. So eight, 10, 10, 10. And again, what's gonna happen if I move up a step and play 12, 12, 12, 10? A G arpeggio. So I'm gonna play the 12 on the D. 12 on the G, 12 on the B, and then 10 on the high E. So you're going from F to G. Now the next thing that we're going to do here is basically re reiterate the same couple of uh, arpeggio shapes that we played at first, only an octave higher. So if you look at how these shapes look, it's exactly like where you started. It's just 12 frets above. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play the 13 on the B string. This is our F major arpeggio again here. 13 high E, 13 B. 14G, 15D, and just like this shape, you know, your F bar chord kind of shape. So 13, 13, 14, 15. Then move up two frets to form your G arpeggio, which is going to go 17 on the D, 16G, 15B, 15 high E. And then we have our last set of inversions here of F to G, which is going to go 17 on the high E, 18 on B, 17G. 19D, again that's just like that C-shaped chord you play down here, and then come up a full step and you're going to play 21, 19, 20, 19. I get like fretboard vertigo on those high frets like that. And then lastly I resolved on the uh, 17th fret high E string, the third of that F major chord right there. Wow, that's a lot of stuff. So let's go through those again here. F major. G major. 
F major, G major, F major, G major, F major, G major, F, G, F. So now let's spend a second talking about the picking hand and what you can do with it to practice this lick. Now, most players, whenever they see notes happening on adjacent strings, like one note on the E, one note on the B, one note on the G, one note on the D, uh, most of us have the instinct to sweep pick this and just use consecutive upstrokes. And then when we see D, G, B, E, most of us want to use consecutive downstrokes there. And, uh, you know, that's sweet picking, and that is one way you could practice this, is to go up, 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 down, 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 down. Up, 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 down, 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 down. That's a really great way to practice your sweet picking, because since you have the doubled up note on the bottom, up, down, that's a good way to help you learn to change gears with that picking hand. Same thing on the top, down, up. You know, without the aid of a pull-off or anything there to help give you time to get to the next string. That's a great way to practice changing directions with your sweep picking. As you do that, just remember to think about your pick as kind of like a paintbrush, right? Where if you're painting a wall and your paintbrush is like this, these work really good, these don't work very good, and the opposite for this. If your paintbrush looks like this, it goes up the wall real good, but down the wall not so much. So remember, as you're doing this with sweep picking, if you want to play it that way, Give your pick a slight turn for when it's going down, and then tilt that paintbrush the other way when it's going up. It doesn't take it doesn't take much. It doesn't take a huge motion, but just a little break angle sure does make that thing flow a lot better. However, that is not how I'm playing. I'm playing it with cross picking. Cross picking is just alternate picking, even when it's completely unnecessary in playing across consecutive uh, strings, like what we're doing with these sweeps and stuff. It's definitely the long way around the bar. It is not a energy or motion saving technique, but the thing that I really like about it is the time feel and the articulation. I can feel a lot more rhythm in this than I can in this. That's the best way to sum it up. If I'm sweeping, it's this. If I'm cross picking, it's this, and I can feel the time much better. Um, there is a speed limit to how fast you can cross pick. Even the sickest cross pickers aren't like Ingve speed sweeping or anything like that. But the great thing is, is if you can practice cross-picking across single note arpeggios like this, there's not a whole lot that you can't do. So as you practice this with cross-picking, I want you to start off with a downstroke and then just down, up, down, up, down, up the entire rest of the way. Down, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, the entire way through. Now what you'll notice about this is in order to make this happen and get your pick going from string to string to string, going down to up, just like this, your pick needs to make, let's say, semicircular movements, like little crescents. If you could trace a line on the tip of the pick right there, you'd see it making little semicircles or little crescents like this. Because if the pick is going straight down, now it's caught in between these two strings. And to make an upstroke happen here, it's got to like jump in and out, upstroke, jump in and out, downstroke. There's no way that's happening at high speeds. But if you can make your picking do these little crescents like this, then you can get in and out of the strings with every single pick stroke. Again, this is really hard to learn how to do. It takes a lot of practice. So don't worry about doing this extremely quickly at first. Just take a look down at your picking hand and see if, you know, the best way I can describe it is with every pick stroke that you make, if the tip of your pick, the very point right there, is getting a little bit of air time above the strings. If you look down and you see the tip of the pick buried in between the strings like this, you're not doing it right. You need to be able to see the tip of the pick lifting out of the strings with every stroke, whether it's down or up in either direction, just like this. I'll kind of exaggerate, so hopefully you guys can see it really well here. Kind of a turning a, a key kind of motion, you know? I recommend just taking two of these arpeggios, like the first two kind of bar chord arpeggios that you have here, or these, and taking them back and forth, just like what I'm doing right here. F, G, F, G. Again, don't worry about fast. That was kind of a little bit too quick. I would go really slow. 
and worry about picking up the speed much later on. If you work on your cross picking, there's not much you won't be able to do. So it's inefficient, it's hard to do, but it is worth it in the long run. Hopefully that gives you guys some cool ideas that'll make your fretboard seem like a much smaller place. Just knowing those simple musical truths that, like I said, if you have an F, then by God you have a G. Keep that in mind always. It doesn't matter what arpeggio shape or chord shape you're doing. If there's an F, there's a G. Try to find your own discoveries around the board too. Try to find the connection between A and B. And find that with arpeggio shapes. And uh, your fretboard will start to seem like a much smaller place in no time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for new lessons every week. You guys can follow me on Instagram at Ben Eller Guitars and on Facebook over at facebook.com slash Uncle Ben Eller. And if you'd like to book some one-on-one -on -one Skype lessons with me, be sure to drop me an email, benellerguitars at gmail.com, and I'll get back to you as quick as I can. Thanks again for watching. I turn this dang internet machine off and go practice. Less clicking, more picking.